They called it the second Rome. A great city astride Europe and Asia. And its vast empire, which would preserve Greco-Roman culture and transmit it to the West, when Rome itself lay in barbarian hands. The Byzantine Empire, this time on the Western tradition. UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The power of the Western Roman Empire lasted five centuries. The power of Babylon and Assyria rather less than that. The Persian Empire took three centuries before Alexander put an end to it, and the British Empire lasted about two centuries. But the Byzantine Empire survived longer than any of these. Only Egypt lasted long. The word Byzantine comes from Byzantium, the old Greek city on the Bosphorus that became the site of Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantines called their lands Romania, and they called themselves Romans, Romayoi. And their empire remained for many centuries the only civilized power in all of Europe. Just as we attribute the creation of the Roman Empire to Augustus, so we can attribute the creation of the Byzantine Empire, which was the second Rome, to Constantine the Great, who transferred the empire's capital to the city that would bear his name, who made the empire a Christian empire, and the emperor into the anointed of the Lord. The Byzantine Empire copied and preserved much of the classical art and literature and Roman law, which we have inherited. And the empire's importance to Eastern Europe is even greater because it was Byzantine missionaries and Byzantine prestige that civilized and Christianized the Eastern Slavs from the Baltic to the Balkans and beyond. For example, this 11th century enamel medallion was made in Georgia, which is now part of the Soviet Union. Constantinople was inaugurated as an imperial capital of the Roman Empire in 330, and it survived until 1453, when the Turkish conquest put an end to one imperial tradition and began another, renaming the city Istanbul. But it was a remarkably long run while it lasted. During this more than a thousand years, the Byzantines conquered and lost several empires. In the 6th century, a Balkan empire was recaptured from the Goths. A Mediterranean empire was built up after a long, hard-fought war also against the Goths and an African empire was reconquered from the Vandals. But the African empire and much of the Middle East were lost to the Arabs in the seventh century. Most of the Mediterranean empire was lost about the same time, with the remainder going in the 11th century, and the Balkan empire was lost and partly regained in the ninth century. The trouble with Constantinople, represented here as a classical figure, was that her tradition was Roman. You can tell this is Rome because of her helmet and military dress.
Constantinople's imperial vision was that of the old Roman Mediterranean Empire, which it was not well placed to run if you bear in mind the problems of time and scale that had proved too much even for Rome to handle. The average ship would take a week or two to cross the Mediterranean from north to south, 15 days from Constantinople to Alexandria. But it could take as much as two or three months from east to west, for example, from Crete to Carthage or Cadiz. So there were considerable obstacles to the realization of the Byzantines' imperial ambition. In the 6th century, when the Emperor Justinian, seen here, regained Italy from the Goths and North Africa from Vandals, he exhausted the resources of Byzantium while also ruining Italy's economy and killing a large part of its population. So it was no accident that the Byzantine Empire reached its high point when it became smaller and more defensible between the 8th and 12th centuries. It had survived new waves of barbarian invasions, but equally important, it had lost its outlying possessions to the Arabs and the Slavs and had become more compact. Yet, whatever happened to its outlying empire, Constantinople remained what Paris was, what New York is today. The foremost city of luxury, fashion and culture, also the city of sin, corruption and material temptation, all of which, however you look at it, is no mean achievement. The city was built on a high peninsula on the Bosphorus where Europe comes very close to the Asian shore. Astride both Europe and Asia, Constantinople was a crossroads par excellence. It commanded the route from the Caucasus and the steppes to the Mediterranean and also the route from the Danube Valley to the Euphrates Valley. The Balkans were its backyard. Asia Minor lay just across the water, and beyond that, Syria and Mesopotamia. So Constantinople was perfectly situated to serve as the capital of a realm that bridged east and west, that connected Greek and Roman culture with Christianity and with Oriental civilization. And its history is indeed the bridge that links us with Egypt, which it came to rule, and with Persia, which it fought and finally defeated, and even with Alexander the Great, whose title of Basileus, or royal king, the Byzantines borrowed for their own rulers. For centuries, Constantinople was the repository of Greek and Roman culture and of the tradition that had been built up in preceding ages in Egypt and Babylon and Athens and Rome and Jerusalem. Our civilization wouldn't be the way it is today if the city of Constantine hadn't endured to transmit these traditions, to transmit the Latin of Rome and the Greek of Athens, the skills, the arts, the thought, the memories to the barbarians of the West and to their gradually more civilized successors. So the survival of the city was crucial because it helped to make our past. Perhaps the most important factor in its survival was the conviction that the empire was willed by God and protected by God and his anointed representatives. On the other hand, it was this same religious conviction that goes a long way to explain the traditionalism, the extreme conservatism of Byzantium. If your state is founded on the will of heaven, why innovate? 
a Byzantine ruler might be dethroned, and God knows enough of them were by murder as shown here, or palace revolutions or riots in the city. But a change of emperor did not mean a change of policy, except in minor details, because to change it would have been something like changing your faith. And so, with heaven's approval secure, the Byzantine sovereign and the Byzantine state were both defenders of the faith. The concentration of all authority in the hands of God's representative, like the emperor depicted here, was in itself a great source of strength. In the West, men lived their lives under a lot of different legal systems, tribal law, local law, manorial law, and the law of the central or would-be central state fought a continuous battle for recognition from the countryside, from the provinces, which took centuries and didn't really get settled until quite recent times. Here, for instance, are great landowners from 6th century Italy who were a law unto themselves. But in the East, there was only one law, and that Roman law emanated from a single source, the ruler. Even the decisions of the councils of the church needed the emperor's approval. This is what has been called Caesaropapism, a political system in which the head of state is also master of the church. And the patriarch, the bishop of Constantinople, lived in the shadow of the imperial palace. When Constantine died in 337 with his heir far from Constantinople, the embalmed remains of the dead emperor continued to rule the empire through a whole summer and autumn and winter, with couriers reading their messages before it, ministers making reports to it, and courtiers seeking audience before it. It's important to realize, however, that even this macabre image of a ruling corpse had its roots in a long past. It was simply the triumph of the Hellenistic view of the emperor's lofty position, a view which had developed in the East since the days of Alexander, which the Romans had taken some time to adopt, but which the emperor Diocletian explicitly claimed in Rome at the end of the third century. And it was very useful because it lent the Byzantine Empire a sort of authority and stability that the old unified empire never had. It did not matter anymore whether the emperor was elected or if he was born to the purple or if he seized power because his throne rested upon more solid foundations than worldly processes could ensure. He was the anointed of the Lord chosen from birth to fulfill the will of heaven. And since Byzantines believed that promotion to rule came solely from God, the imperial throne was open to everybody, peasant and noble, to scholars and to unlearned men, the only condition being that the ruler should be an orthodox Christian. Leo I in the 5th century had been a butcher. People in Constantinople used to point out the stall where he and his wife had sold meat. Justin I in the 6th century was a poor swineherd from the countryside who first appeared in the capital with bare feet and a pack on his back. And then one day his nephew left the family village to join him. 
His name was Justinian, and he became emperor in 527. Phocas, who ruled in the 7th century, was a simple centurion. Leo III in the 8th century was an odd job man. Basil I in the 9th century was a peasant, probably a shepherd from Macedonia. And Michael IV in the 11th century was a servant from Paphlagonia on the Black Sea. But once a man had become emperor, there was no constitutional method by which he could be deposed except a successful revolution. And here again, the fact of success set the seal of heavenly approval upon the man who, had he failed, would have been a mere usurper and would have been punished in the most terrible way. The Byzantines knew that Jehovah had transferred his favor from Saul to David. They believed that God would withdraw his support from any ruler, and then you would know it, because the ruler would fall. And with this belief, revolution itself was incorporated into the body of constitutional practices. As the German historian Mommsen said, Roman government was an autocracy tempered by the legal right of revolution. Out of 88 emperors who ruled in Byzantium through 11 centuries, over one third would be usurpers and as many died in violent circumstances. Poisoned, stabbed, strangled, beheaded, starved, tortured to death, or simply blinded, which was considered more humane. As one result, it became particularly important to emphasize the sanctity of the emperor, his distance, his untouchableness. The more vulnerable the emperor in fact, the greater the efforts to make him appear invulnerable in principle. This is Constantius II and his empress who ruled in the 4th century. This is when the empire is most threatened, in their time and throughout the third, fourth, and fifth centuries. And this is when the personal position of the emperor is least secure. This is when the imperial ceremonies stiffen and the distance grows between the ruler and his subjects. A spectacular, megalomaniac kind of drama is devised both to enhance power and to make up for the shortcomings in this power. You can see this if you look at the mosaics of the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora. Stiff and splendid in the midst of their courtiers, their posture reminiscent of the unmoved mover the highest power in the cosmos. Although it was very important that the emperor should impress upon his subjects this feeling of divinity, which might help to preserve him from an undignified end, it was equally important that he should impress the barbarians, friend or foe. This was rather more feasible because barbarians were less sophisticated. So imagine the arrival in Constantinople of a barbarian chieftain from the steppes, from the desert, or even from the underdeveloped countries in Western Europe. He finds himself in this terrific maze of streets and concentrated humanity. He is taken over by imperial officials who look after him every day, every hour, who show him the sights, and who finally take him to the palace for an audience with the emperor. To get to the throne room, he passes through a sort of palace of the Wizard of Oz, through a maze of marble corridors and chambers rich with mosaic and cloth of gold, 
through long lines of palace guards in white uniforms, through great crowds of patricians, bishops, senators, and all of this to the music of organs and church choirs with eunuchs on either side of him holding him under the armpits. Until at last he enters the octagonal room where this silent, stiff, completely motionless figure is seated on an elevated throne veiled by purple fabrics, purple being the imperial color and forbidden to everybody else. The furniture of the room is very strange. There are golden lions, golden griffins, golden birds perched on golden trees, rather like a sort of glorified mechanical toy store gone wild. And all of this is set in motion by the chieftain's entrance. The animals open their mouths, the birds open their beaks and sing, the griffins whistle, the lions roar and thrash their tails, and meanwhile, the visitor has to prostrate himself. And when he gets up, he cannot see either the emperor or the throne. Finally, he discovers that the throne has somehow risen way up and the emperor is still sitting on it, stiff, painted, but now wearing another costume than the one he had apparently been wearing a moment before and certainly too far away to hold a conversation. The man is not just impressed, he is befuddled. He is dominated by all this splendor. He agrees to fight for the Roman Christ and for the Empire. He will be kept happy by presents, honors, subsidies. He may be given a Byzantine princess in marriage. He will certainly be sent a bishop who is subject to the Patriarch of Constantinople and who will sustain imperial interests. The Byzantines and their emperors understood well that diplomacy is cheaper than war because when it works, your enemies do your fighting for you. And even when it doesn't work, it helps to buy time. But all of this needed money, a lot of money. In the third century, remember, the imperial administration of the United Empire pretty much broke down. Inflation sent prices rocketing sky high, and the economy of the empire threatened to regress into a system of bath. But then in the fourth century, reform restored the value of money, and taxation was re-established, which could be used to keep up a bureaucratic government. Now, this saved the East, but it couldn't save the West, which lapsed back into a barter economy under its barbarian rulers and grew weaker and weaker because it could not pay to protect itself. The Eastern part of the empire, however, was safeguarded by firm administration and stable economy which bolstered its diplomacy and enabled it to pay its soldiers with gold. The East's ability to tax enabled it to maintain a highly trained army and navy which could preserve the empire. War for Byzantium was a desperately serious business. So the Byzantines kept and developed strategies and practical improvements in a way that barbarians and later lords of the West cared little about. The Byzantines developed drill, they developed tactics, they also developed secret weapons like Greek fire, a petrol-based mixture rather like napalm that could be shot from ships and from battlements. It proved deadly against Arab and Slavonic fleets. And they did great things with small numbers. This medallion commemorates the triumph of Justinian's general Belisarius, 
who reconquered North Africa from the Vandals with about 15,000 men, and Italy with only about 8,000. By the 10th century, the grand total of Byzantine military forces was at most 140,000 men. But there was one institution that was even more important to the survival and the unity of the Byzantine Empire than the army, and that was the church we now call Greek Orthodox. Greek because Byzantium had been an ancient Greek city and its successor Constantinople inherited its Hellenistic traditions. Orthodox, because it alone in its own eyes represented correct doctrine. The church's faith became the bond that in large measure took the place of a common nationality. And its position in society was crucial to the state in ways that the Latin church in Rome never was. We shall see why and how in our next program. Funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Constantinople, the greatest city of its time and the gateway to Europe. For centuries, the Muslims had tried and failed to conquer the Christians in their impregnable walled city. If Constantinople were ever to fall, the whole of Europe would be vulnerable. With the roar of cannon fire, the East gave warning to the West that people were no longer safe behind their city walls. In 1453, the Muslims were trying again, and this time with a new weapon. A weapon so powerful that even Constantinople's massive battlements might not withstand the pounding. If the combination of a determined Muslim leader and this fantastic new weapon could break the stalemate, the siege of Constantinople would truly be one of history's turning points. For 800 years, Constantinople was the world's richest city, center of trade, bridging Asia and Europe. When Rome fell to the barbarians in the fourth century, Constantinople took its place as the capital of the great Roman Empire. But 11 centuries later, this once great empire had shrunk to little more than an impoverished city-state.
Its new leader, Constantine XI, ruled over a capital that was bankrupt. Its lush gardens overgrown, its palaces deserted, and its people dispersed. Yet Constantinople remained the center of the Orthodox Christian Church, while Rome was the center of the Catholic Church. Each were jealous of the other's power and influence. This division was so great that to Rome, the Orthodox Church was an even greater enemy than Islam. What was to follow was a brutal Christian feud. But the city would always remember how the Roman Catholic Crusaders bloodily sacked Constantinople in 1204, when it possessed two-thirds of Europe's wealth. One horrified eyewitness wrote at the time, I do not know where to begin the story of what these monsters committed. They broke the holy images. They hurled the sacred relics of the martyrs into unmentionable places. They scattered the body and the blood of the Savior. They seized the chalices and tore out their precious stones and drank from them. The city never recovered its former glory. By the time Constantine XI inherited the imperial throne in 1449, Constantinople was surrounded by an aggressive enemy. Constantinople had become a Christian enclave in the middle of the Ottoman Empire, which now extended from the Danube to the Euphrates, including Bosnia, Bulgaria, Greece, and Serbia. As early as the seventh century, Muslims had attempted to wrestle the city away from the Christian Byzantine Empire. Ayo Pensari, the Prophet Muhammad's standard bearer, had died in his attempt to capture the city in 674 AD. The huge walls had withstood wave after wave of attack and proved to be the finest fortress in the world. 800 years after Ayo Pensari's death, another Ottoman Sultan, Mehmet II, declared, There is only one thing I want. Give me Constantinople. This ambitious 21-year-old general was determined to ride into the city as its conqueror. <laughs> Mehmet dreamed of creating an empire even greater than Rome at its height. But his grand vision would not be complete without a majestic capital city. He needed Constantinople. The young sultan was well educated in the arts, languages and the sciences. He was a man excited by new ideas. He made sure his troops were equipped with the latest weapons. Mehmet wanted to be remembered as the conqueror, the sultan who succeeded where all his forefathers had failed. It was the Emperor Constantine who now stood in his way. Constantine was proud of his inheritance. The city was his life, and he would defend it to the last. Constantine paid gold to his enemies in an attempt to keep the peace. Mehmet watched Constantinople run out of money and refused to renegotiate the terms. In the winter of 1451, he cut off Constantinople's supplies. He built his own massive fortress, the Rumeli Hizar. It had walls 25 feet thick and was completed in only four months. From there, Mehmet now commanded the Bosphorus, where the strait is at its narrowest. 
With this new castle, the Sultan was able to put a stranglehold on Constantinople's shipping, severing the city's lifeline. Ships loaded with Ukrainian grain could not pass the Ottoman cannon. When Mehmet ordered his navy into the Sea of Marmara, the blockade was complete. Constantinople was cut off from the rest of the world. Constantine was desperate. He sent gifts to the Sultan and promised to increase the gold shipments. Mehmet wasn't interested, but he did offer Constantine a deal. Territory in Greece and religious freedom for his population in exchange for the city. Constantine refused. How could he surrender his city and everything that was its heritage? Classical Greece, Rome and Christianity. His last letter to Mehmet tells it all. As it is clear that thou desirest more war than peace, I turn now and look alone to God. However, I release thee from all thy oaths and treaties with me, and closing the gates of my capital, I will defend my people to the last drop of my blood. On April the 6th, the Sultan pitched his red and gold tent outside the city walls. The defenders of the city awoke to a chilling sight as they looked out over the Ottoman camp. They were outnumbered by 10 to 1. At the heart of the Sultan's army was an elite corps of Muslim converts, the Janissaries. These zealously aggressive troops were recruited as children from the Ottoman Empire's most warlike states, Bosnia, Serbia, and Albania, to wage this holy war against Constantinople. Mehmet gave Constantine one last chance. He sent a message under a flag of truce to the city. I will, as the law commands, spare you, the citizens of this great city, harm neither your families nor your belongings, if you voluntarily surrender to me. Constantine rejected the ultimatum. Mehmet attacked. Against the odds, Mehmet's troops were turned back. The first victory went to Constantine. Stunned by this defeat, the Sultan was forced to change his tactics. He brought in artillery to destroy the city's massive walls. Most impressive of all was a giant cannon, the largest gun ever made. It was an astonishing 29 feet from muzzle to breech with a 26-inch bore and fired a half-ton marble cannonball more than a mile. It required 60 oxen and 400 men to use it and took two hours to load. The cannon enabled the Ottomans to fight with the most sophisticated piece of weaponry in the world. More than 60 large cannons were cast in temporary foundries outside Constantinople. The assault continued day and night, with no relief from the clashes and explosions. For the Sultan hoped to take the city easily, since we were few against many, by pounding us to death. He allowed us no rest from the attack. 
With continuous salvos, the Ottoman cannon breached the wall in several places, but the Byzantines defiantly fought off the assaults and repaired the walls. Mehmet then built a huge siege tower, only to see it burnt to the ground by a small raiding party from inside the walls. Twelve weeks into the siege, neither the artillery barrage nor the attacks by the Muslim army had been successful. The Sultan's army was on the point of deserting, and he was forced to rethink his strategy. Until now, he had only been able to attack small sections of the wall that were easily defended. Most of Constantinople was protected by the sea. On the northern side of the city, the Christians had stretched a great chain across the mouth of the Golden Horn, thus blocking access to the city's harbor. Mehmet, in a moment of genius, bypassed the chain by hauling part of his fleet across a narrow stretch of land. Overnight, they brought 30 ships into Constantinople's protected harbor. As dawn broke, the Christians woke to discover that the Ottoman war fleet had surrounded the city. The Christians were devastated and morale collapsed. But Emperor Constantine stood by his decision to defend his city to the last. How could I leave the churches of our Lord and the throne in such a plight? What would the world say about me? I pray you, my friends, in future do not say to me anything else but, Nay, sire! Do not leave us. Never, never shall I leave you. I am resolved to die here with you. But now, completely surrounded, the defenders had to spread themselves along the entire length of the city's walls. It was an impossible task. At this moment, Mehmet used another brilliant tactic. He aimed all his cannons at the same section of the wall. Within a month, the walls began to crumble. With victory in sight, Luck also played its part in securing the Ottoman victory. The lost tomb of Ayo Pensare, friend and fallen disciple of the Prophet Muhammad, was found by two Janissaries close to the city walls. This was taken as a good omen for an Islamic victory. The Christians received different omens. Their tradition held that the city of Constantinople would never fall while the moon was in the heavens. But on the night of the 24th of May, there was a full eclipse of the moon, bringing three hours of darkness. An evil omen indeed. Four days later, shortly after sunset, the last Christian liturgy in St. Sophia began. The emperor arrived just before midnight and there made peace with God before returning to his post on the city walls. The prayers continued throughout the night and the church filled with refugees as the sound of Ottoman artillery grew ever more intense. The reports of muskets, the ringing of bells, the 
clashing of arms, the cries of fighting men, the shrieks of women, and the wailing of children produced such a noise that it seemed as if the earth trembled. Night gave way to day, word came that the walls had finally been breached. Soon, the first Ottoman soldiers forced their way into the cathedral, bringing to an end 1,000 years of Roman history. The last outpost of the Roman Empire, Byzantium, had fallen. The victorious soldiers spent three days of looting, raping, and killing. Men were butchered, women and children became slaves. Mehmet made his entrance into the city. He went straight to the holiest of the Christian shrines, the Church of the Holy Wisdom, St. Sophia. While a Muslim cleric sang, There is no God but God, the Sultan proclaimed St. Sophia a mosque. The Byzantine Empire had come to an end. Emperor Constantine was dead. Where his grave is now is lost to history. However, not far from this church, a headless body was found. The corpse wore purple boots on which the imperial double-headed eagles were embroidered. Many believed that this was Constantine XI the last Roman emperor who had died defending his city and his people. Perhaps his grave is here. The day after the conquest, Mehmet issued a decree stating that this church should remain a Christian sanctuary forever. Christian Constantinople was renamed Istanbul, the heart of the Ottoman Empire, which proved to be one of the world's most powerful and long-lasting. It survived for over 500 years until the end of the First World War. The conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans was a turning point that sent shockwaves throughout the world. The very survival of Christianity in Europe was threatened. The Silk Road was closed, 
the great trade route to the east was no longer in Christian hands. Europe turned westwards in search of a new route. The age of discovery had begun. The siege of Constantinople started a new era of warfare throughout the world. Mehmet had captured Constantinople with the roar of cannon fire. Since 1453, artillery has been the backbone of every successful army in history. What? 